Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that I hadn't personally heard of previously, but when I looked into it, I thought that this case was a great example of really good police work. I know a lot of the cases that we cover on this channel involve a lot of police missteps and sometimes even police corruption or corruption in the government, but not every case is like that and this case highlights that. There are a lot of really good cops out there who genuinely care about their job and about the victim and for getting the victim and their family justice. So I wanted to make sure that I highlight good police work on this channel once in a while, so that is why I'm bringing this case to you today. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Liquid IV. Liquid IV is a great tasting electrolyte drink mix that is the perfect way to stay hydrated. I live in Arizona, which is a very dry, hot desert climate, so it's really important that I stay hydrated. All of my friends are literally obsessed with liquid IV, so I've been using it for so long now. I actually have a stockpile of my liquid IV in my closet to make sure that I never run out. Drinking one liquid IV hydration multiplier hydrates you faster and more efficiently than water. Liquid IV is powered by the science of cellular transport technology, which is designed to enhance rapid absorption of water and other key ingredients. Plus, they taste amazing. I have so many different flavors right now. Like I said, I literally have a stockpile in my closet, but some of my favorites have to be lemon lime and one of their new flavors, tropical punch. These flavors really pack a punch, so it makes keeping up with your liquid intake even easier. Liquid IV is so easy to just grab with you and pack it on the go. I actually just went on a road trip where I was in California going to different national parks, and let me tell you, my liquid IV came in clutch. I was sleeping in a van that didn't have AC, and there were parts that were so hot and so dry and then in addition to that I was hiking and you know going different places doing different things so it really was important for me to stay hydrated and a liquid IV made that so much easier. Liquid IV is also amazing for those of you who like to enjoy an alcoholic beverage from time to time whether you need it to stay hydrated throughout the night or the next day to get those electrolytes back into your system. These are an amazing trick my friends and I all use them to make sure that we're staying healthy and hydrated all through throughout our nights out. So if you want to try these best-selling hydration multiplier flavors, Liquid IV is offering my subscribers 15% off of your order when you use my code RACHELSHANNON15. So again, make sure you head over to Liquid IV's website and use code RACHELSHANNON15 for 15% off of your Liquid IV order. Thank you again so much to Liquid IV for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the murder of Ronald Platt. So this case starts on July 28th, 1996. It was around 5 a.m. when a commercial fishing trip was pulling up to an English channel off of the south coast of Devon, a coast in South England. They cast their net in hopes of catching fish, but when they pulled it back up, it was much heavier than they were used to and at this time, they thought that they may have just hit the jackpot with this catch. But as they looked closer, they realized that what they just caught was actually a human body who belonged to a male. The man was wearing a blue and white checkered shirt, green pants, a leather belt, and his pockets were actually turned inside out, and he was wearing a Rolex watch. Immediately, they contacted the National Guard, who then contacted the local authorities. At this time, the body was completely unidentified identifiable and there were no missing persons reports out at that time so the initial thought was that maybe this man died as the result of a horrible accident or maybe he took his own life maybe he had fallen off of a cliff or had a terrible boating accident Things like that are relatively common around this area. So they didn't think that anything nefarious was going on, but either way, they did send his body off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. They found that this man was in his 40s or 50s, and it was determined that his body had been in the water for about a week before he was found. They actually found that this man had numerous injuries, including bruises on his arms and legs. He had a gash in the back of his head, which indicated that he had actually been hit with a 
large, heavy object. His lungs were also filled with water. So with these findings, they actually ruled that this man's death was a homicide. They now thought that this man had been beaten, robbed, and then thrown into the water where he ultimately drowned. Now the jobs of the investigators were to identify this man. The man actually had a tattoo on the back of his hand, which to them at the time looked like a star, but they couldn't really figure out exactly what it was. And again, he was wearing a Rolex watch. So with this kind of luxury, expensive watch, they have certain aspects to them that make them very unique and therefore traceable. One of the investigators was able to identify that this was actually an oyster model worth thousands of dollars. They also knew that these types of watches came with with serial numbers, which are meticulously booked and recorded. This helps the company keep track of when and where exactly a watch was purchased. So investigators used this serial number to track down the watch, therefore tracking down the person who owned it. It actually took them six weeks because remember in the 90s, they didn't really have everything logged into a computer. So it's not like you could just type up the serial number and it would just pop up. They pretty much had to go and follow physical records and follow leads based off of those. But ultimately, they were able to identify the body as belonging to a man named Ronald Platt. Ronald's last known address was a house that he rented in Chelmsford near Essex, which is around four hours northeast from where his body had been found. Ronald's next of kin was his brother, so police notified him and gathered more information about Ronald Platt and who he was. They found out that Ronald was actually 51 years old, and that tattoo on the back of his hand was actually a Canadian maple leaf, he had been born and grew up in Canada, but moved to England later in his life. But those around him said that he was always so passionate about Canada. He loved it so much. He wanted to move back there and he took any chance that he got to go back and visit. Ronald Platt was described as a quiet, reserved man who had a small circle of friends. He spent most of his time alone and didn't keep much contact with his family. His former partner, who I will discuss in just a minute, described him as warm and caring. He was a gentle man who didn't cause any trouble for those around him. He really just kept to himself. So that's why Ronald's family didn't report him as missing because they didn't really keep much contact with him and neither did his friends. So now police had their work to do to figure out more about the people in Ronald's life and to figure out what led him to being murdered. So on his original rental application for his house, Ronald had listed a 52-year-old man named David Davis as a reference. This man also lived in the same area as Ronald, so police were able to find his phone number and get a hold of him. When they got a hold of David, they told him that his friend Ronald had been found dead. Now, David spoke with an American accent, and when he heard this news, he didn't sound too shocked or upset. He told police that he actually hadn't seen Ronald in several months. He said that the last time Ronald spoke with him, he was actually planning to move to Paris to open his own electronics store. He said, as far as he knew, that's where he still was. But he was very helpful with police and said that if they needed anything else or if they had more questions to feel free to reach back out to him. So police took advantage of that and they wanted to go visit David in person. So they went to the area and wanted to go visit the address that was listed on Ronald's records as belonging to David. And I guess the addresses were a little bit confusing. I think it wasn't clear which house was which. So when they knocked on the door that they believed belonged to David, they were greeted by an elderly couple. This couple told police that they didn't know anybody with the name of David Davis, but they did know that they had a neighbor named Ronald Platt. They said that Ronald Platt had still lived there with his young wife and two children. They said that they seemed like a normal couple and they did think that it was strange that his wife was so much younger than him, but otherwise they didn't cause any trouble and they just kind of kept to themselves. So obviously at this point, something is very off. Ronald Platt is deceased. He's not next door with a wife and kids. Maybe the older couple was confused and just thought that they had seen Ronald more recently than they actually did. So police went digging and they found out that Ronald had actually once been in a long-term relationship with a woman named Elaine Boys. The two were separated at this time, but they'd been together for 10 years. 
So police contacted Elaine and they told her about what happened to Ronald. Obviously, she was very devastated that her ex-partner was found dead. She told police that they had actually met in England, but they moved back to Canada for a period of time. But things didn't work out there, so they separated and made their separate ways back to England eventually but she still cared about him so deeply and she had no idea who would want to do this to Ronald. Police asked if she had ever heard of anybody named David Davis and she said yes. She described him as a wealthy businessman who was in his 40s or 50s who was from the United States. She said that her and David had actually known each other for several years and they had worked together on several business ventures. She said that the last time that she had spoken with David was actually pretty recently. It was after police had spoken with him originally. So she was confused as to why David didn't tell her about Ronald's death. The two were in a relationship for 10 years and her and Ronald had known David for many years as well. So why did he neglect to tell her that her former partner and his friend was dead? Once Elaine got off the phone with police, she immediately called David to tell him what she just learned about Ronald. At this point, she was just confused, but also a little suspicious as to why David didn't say anything. So when she asked him, David actually hopped on the next train and saw Elaine in person. And he explained that after finding out about Ronald's death, he was just crying and very upset. And he was just keeping to himself and trying to make sense of Ronald dying. So that's why he hadn't said anything to her. But to Elaine, something just was not right. Police told her that David had told them about Ronald moving to Paris to open this store, but she did not think that was true. Then, in addition to this, police actually found several witnesses who saw David and Ronald together just a week before his death. They also found that there were cell phone records that showed that both Ronald and David were in the area of Devon just before Ronald's death. Again, this was strange because the both of them lived about four hours northeast of Devon, and Albert had told police that he hadn't seen him in months. So clearly he was lying about something and there was a reason that he was lying. Then police found out that David was actually living at the address that was listed under Ronald's name. Ronald Platt had been paying for the apartment and the bills under his own name and these payments continued even after Ronald was found dead. Clearly, something just was not right about David Davis, so they were able to get an arrest warrant for David, and they showed up to the home that was listed under Ronald's name that they believed that David was living at. When they got there, as the police were walking up, they actually saw a man bolt out of the house and then run up to a taxi that happened to be driving by and hopped in. The taxi zoomed off with the man still inside, but police turned their lights on and they followed the taxi and before long the taxi stopped. Out of the cab came David Davis and he was arrested on suspicion of killing Ronald Platt. He was brought into the police station for questioning and then at the same time police went back to his home to speak with David's family. When they got there they met his wife Noelle. Now Noelle was a beautiful young woman but once again she looked significantly younger than David. She looked to be in her early to mid 20s while David was in his early 50s. They also had two young children together, a six-month-old and a two-year-old. Other than the odd age difference though, they seemed like the normal family. And again, everybody who lived around them said that they seemed perfectly normal. However, when police told Noelle that she needed to come with them to the police station to see her husband, they noticed when she grabbed her diaper bag that it looked unusually heavy. So they looked inside of the bag and this is when they found quite literally the jackpot. They found that there was 4,000 British pounds in there, which is equivalent to about 9,500 US dollars in today's money. They also found that there were two gold bars worth around 25,000 pounds each, so $30,000 each in today's US dollar. Then they searched Noelle's purse, and this is when they found several forms of IDs, such as driver's license and credit cards, all in Ronald Platt's name. They found that there were several forms of ID in Elaine Boyce's name, as well. And then in addition to that, they actually found their children's birth certificates. And on their birth certificates, 
Elaine and Ronald were listed as their parents. But again, police spoke with Elaine and she made no mention of having children with Ronald. And even beyond that, why would they be in David and Noelle's care? So clearly something very strange was happening here. It was clear to police at this time that David Davis had been using Ronald's identity and in order to do so, he had to be the one who murdered Ronald. But the more that police looked into David, they uncovered even more they realized that his name wasn't even David Davis. That too was an alias. His real name was actually Albert Johnson Walker and he was not from the US, he was from Canada. So let's talk more about who Albert Walker is and what exactly led him to assuming the identity of Ronald Platt and ultimately to killing him. So Albert Walker was born on August 5th, 1945 in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. He had dropped out of high school and went on to jump around from different and odd jobs when he was a young adult. One of these jobs was at a library at the University of Waterloo. By the age of 23 in 1968, he had met a student who went to that university named Barbara. The two hit it off very quickly and they began a relationship and they became married only three weeks after that on October 25th, 1968. And the two moved in together and settled in their home in Ayr. He joined Barbara's family in the community and he was quickly accepted as one of their own. However, Albert struggled to make a living for himself and his family. He worked a bunch of different odd jobs over the next 10 years, but nothing seemed to work out for him. He tried working retail, he tried manual labor jobs, he tried his hand as a cattle rancher, but none of those jobs seemed to work out for him. He also went to school part-time, but once again, nothing seemed to work out. He tried getting a degree in creative writing from the University of Edinburgh. He tried computer training at Harlow Watt University, as well as business administration at Waldred Laurier University. But none of this worked out and he continued to struggle to make money. By 1972, Barbara became pregnant with their first daughter, Jillian. Over the course of the next 10 years, they went on to have three more children, two daughters named Sheena and Heather, and then a son named Duncan. Albert and the family went to Knox United Church, and he served as a youth counselor and a Sunday school teacher at the church, and he was very well liked in his community. Him and his wife Barbara seemed to be a nice, trustworthy couple in the community who were just making an honest living and trying to raise their children. Albert took up work doing people's tax returns to make some extra money. This started as more of a side gig for him, but as more people learned about his services, the more people became interested and asked Albert to do their taxes. So Albert took this as an opportunity to grow his business into something more. By 1978, he started his own company called Walker's Financial Services. They handled company payroll as well as income tax services for other companies. By 1980, he expanded his business and he purchased another bookkeeping company called Oxford Bookkeeping. From there, his business ventures continued to grow and he kept coming up with new ideas for expanding. By 1982, he started a new company that stored investors' money in offshore accounts in the Cayman Islands in the Caribbean. This would serve as an investment opportunity for his clients, which offered tax savings because they were storing their money in offshore accounts. By 1990, Albert landed a huge opportunity. At this time, he continued to be seen around the community and his church as an honest, hardworking man who was just providing for his family. So fellow churchgoers would often go to Albert with their investments because they trusted him to handle their money. One couple in particular, George and Sheila Richardson, they found themselves in possession of a huge lump sum of money after George's father passed away and his estate was passed down to George. This included $5.1 million as well well as George's father's farm. They asked Albert for help in selling his farm and he landed them a deal where they were paid $3.5 million for their farm. This was a much better deal than they were expecting or getting any other way without Albert's help. So they were really excited that he was able to get them so much money for the farm. 
So in total, they were coming to Albert with $9 million that they wanted to invest in offshore accounts to save for their retirement. It was said that this is the deal in particular that really just inflated Albert's ego. He started traveling around Canada, the US, the Caribbean, Mexico, and Switzerland. He started to adopt this fancy taste in clothing and food at five-star restaurants. He bought himself a brand new Jaguar sports car and he actually started sleeping with other women. To outsiders, he continued to appear like a happily married man who now had a successful business and was able to afford nicer things. But this was not the case. Eventually, he did admit to his wife that he had been sleeping with other women and they tried to salvage their marriage by going to marriage counseling, but this did not work. His wife filed for divorce and battled for custody for their four children. And at this time, Albert had actually secretly rented a home in Bratford, England. And while Barbara was at work, he quietly moved all four children into his home without giving Barbara the address or any other contact information to find them. So obviously this isn't cool. This is pretty much just kidnapping your kids. So Barbara took him to court again and she tried to get custody of all four children. But Albert came back and said that his children actually wanted to be with him. Their oldest children wrote letters to the court saying that they wanted to be with their father because they felt like they had more freedom with him. They thought that he was more affectionate towards them and overall they just preferred to be with him. The entire custody custody battle was just nasty and things just were not good between them anymore. So it was decided that they would split custody 50-50. It was decided that their oldest daughters, Sheena and Jillian, would stay with Albert at his home while their younger children, Heather and Duncan, would stay with Barbara. They also decided that Barbara would get to keep the home that her and Albert once lived in together. Then as all of this was going on, the walls started closing in on Albert and people started to realize that he's not the honest businessman that everybody thought he was. He was making his riches by embezzling money from his investors. He was taking hundreds of thousands of dollars from his investors who trusted him to keep their money in this offshore bank account, and he was actually transferring the money into his own bank accounts under his own name. Now going back to the deal I just discussed a minute ago, a few months after Albert had taken this $9 million from the Richardson couple, he went back to them, showing them a list of what was in their portfolio. However, their portfolio only showed that 3.5 million dollars. They asked him where the rest of their money went, but he wasn't giving them any straight answers. They eventually demanded in writing that he would return all of their money, but he simply just ignored them and wouldn't respond. There were several others who entrusted Albert with their money and a lot of elderly couples especially. And by 1990, Albert had a total sum of 10 to $12 million in his possession through his investors. But more and more investors started to notice that there was just money missing. And when he would be pressed about where their money is, he would always just give some sort of roundabout answer or would straight up ignore them. Now, by November of 1990, Albert told Barbara that he was going to be taking their 15-year-old daughter, Sheena, on a two-week trip to Great Britain. So he dropped Jillian off at Barbara's house and off him and Sheena went. However, Two weeks came and went and Albert and Sheena did not return back to Canada and Barbara was beside herself. She was worried about Albert kidnapping her daughter and hiding out somewhere with her. He had already tried to do this with all four of their children before, so she was so very concerned at this point. She actually hired a private investigator to find out where they went, but they found no traces of him. What they did find, however, was all of Albert's fraud and embezzlement. Turns out he had embezzled about $3.2 million and his company, Walker's Financial Services, went bankrupt with about $2.8 million worth of claims against them. Before he left, he had also purchased diamond earrings and a ring worth $12,000, which he didn't ultimately pay for. Also, turns out he had taken out a second mortgage on their home without Barbara's knowledge. So Albert left and he left Barbara behind with all of this debt and they were finding out that all of Albert's assets were paid for with stolen money and his investors were after Albert for all of the money that he had taken from them. 
So Ontario police put out an arrest warrant for Albert on counts of theft, fraud, and money laundering. But of course, he was nowhere to be found. He was a wanted man in Canada, and he had actually made it to number four on Interpol's most wanted list as well. So it was clear at this time that so many people were closing in on Albert for stealing millions of dollars, and he was going to have to answer for it. So instead of facing the people that he stole money from and possibly getting jail time for it, he left. He fled to Britain with his daughter and they adopted new identities. It was here that Albert took the name of David Davis, who was one of his past investors back in Canada, but he sort of just took on the name. He didn't actually have any forms of identification that had his name on it. Then his daughter Sheena would take on the name of Noel. They settled in an area of North Yorkshire, England, and they picked their lives back up. They picked back up where they left off. They continued going to church, and those around Albert described him as helpful and kind. By 1991, Albert had been at an auction house near where he lived in Yorkshire. This is where he met a receptionist named Elaine Boys. He introduced himself as a semi-retired businessman from America. For the sake of this part of the story, I'm going to go back to calling him David, and then I'll switch back to calling him Albert later, so hopefully that's not too confusing, but for now, let's go back to calling him David. Either way, he was charismatic and animated when he spoke with Elaine, and she was intrigued by him. They started talking about their shared interests in different business ventures, and eventually, they got on to talking about more personal things. This is when Elaine brought up that she had a partner named Ronald Platt. She told him about how much Ronald loved Canada, and they were even thinking of moving out there someday. So, David used this as an opportunity to tell Elaine about his business called Cavendish Corporation Limited. He said that she seemed like the perfect fit for an open job that he had there. It paid well, it had amazing benefits, and he would take care of any arrangements that it took for her to join on in his business ventures. It seemed like an offer that Elaine just could not refuse, so Elaine introduced David to her partner, Ronald. It was at this time that David offered to put both Elaine and Ronald as the business's director and officer. Elaine would be the sole shareholder in the company, but she actually signed an agreement which named David as the recipient of these shares. When David was asked why he was so keen on assigning his company over to them, he said that him and his wife had just recently gotten divorced and she was trying to take him for any money that he had. So it would be best if his name wasn't on the paperwork. He seemed very honest and upfront about everything that he wanted and needed from the couple, so this didn't seem like anything nefarious to them. To them, it just seemed like an amazing opportunity to have a business and do business things with their friend. As a part of Elaine's job, she was going to travel around different countries throughout Europe to scope out investment properties for the company. As she did that, David would give her money to store in his offshore bank accounts, which was later are going to be taken out and spent on these investment properties. But he never took any of the money out and he never actually bought any of these properties. What she was actually doing was she was helping David continue to take money from his investors and then depositing it into his own account under the guise of this new company, so she was unwittingly helping him launder money. David had also convinced them to open up their own bank accounts under their own personal names in England, France, Switzerland, and Italy to do banking for the company in all of these different areas. But once again, it was just another ploy to launder money. Now at this time, things were going great for David and his daughter Noelle. But by 1992, Noelle was 18 years old and she actually found herself pregnant. This put a whole new spin on things. David realized that neither him or Noelle had any real forms of identification. There was no way that Noelle would have been able to get any of the medical care that she would need to have a healthy pregnancy and to give birth to a baby without any forms of IDs. So it was at this time that David realized that he needed to adopt another new identity 
and his next target was Elaine and Ronald. So by Christmas Eve of 1992, David had invited Ronald and Elaine over to his home to celebrate. And at this time, he announced that he would be buying them one-way tickets so that the both of them could move to Canada. He was basically going to fund their entire move, but he asked them to move by February of 1993. They were hesitant at first to be moving so soon and so suddenly, but Ronald loved Canada, as we said before. He had always dreamed of moving back there anyways, and this was the perfect opportunity. And he had a friend that was willing to foot the bill for the entire thing. However, David told them that they could still stay as directors of the company, even though they'd be living in Canada. He said that their names could stay on the business and they'd continue making money from the business, but he would need some forms of identification from them. He said that because they were living so far away, he would need to hold on to their birth certificates, their driver's license, and he could make a rubber stamp of their signatures. Since they'd be living so far away, David said that he would handle all of the paperwork on his end. If anything needed to be signed under their names, then he could just stamp their signature and they wouldn't have to worry about traveling back and forth just to sign papers. Obviously, the couple didn't have a lot of knowledge Knowledge about business or how things were really supposed to work. So they didn't see this as being anything other than a standard deal for being the director of a business. So they accepted his deal. They boarded their plane and they arrived in Calgary, Alberta, Canada in February of 1993. So with Ronald and Elaine both now living in Canada, Albert now had the possession of their IDs and these signature stamps. He could now take on the identities of Ronald and Elaine. However, at this time, because Sheena was pregnant, Albert decided that it only made sense that to explain this, they now had to pose as a married couple. So instead of being father-daughter and the daughter just being, you know, a teen mom, they had to now pose as husband and wife. So imagine having to like pretend to be married to your dad. That is just gross. But he convinced his daughter that this was the only way that they could go about their lives as they knew it. So now both of them were married and Albert took on Ronald's identity. Sheena actually kept her name as Noelle, but whenever she needed medical services, she would use Elaine's IDs. And as we saw from before, Elaine's name is also listed on her children's birth certificates. But as it turned out, life for Ronald and Elena in Canada wasn't all that they thought it would be. Elena didn't really like living in Canada and she just could not find a way to make it work. She decided that she was going to be moving back to England, but Ronald just could not part with his beloved country at that time. He loved Canada and he wanted to keep living there. So even though they tried making their relationship work, they did ultimately decide to part ways and Elaine moved back to England and Ronald stayed in Canada. Albert actually didn't know that Elaine returned to England for quite a while while until they ran into each other at a wedding of a mutual friend. Elaine actually told Albert that her and Ronald had split up and he was staying in Canada while she was in England, but Albert said that she needs to go back to Canada. She needs to give Ronald another chance and she needs to do whatever she can to make things work with him. But it wasn't that simple for Elaine. She was in England for good. She really couldn't afford to be out in Canada and she honestly did not like the weather there. And besides, England was where all of her friends and her family was, so there was really no reason for her to want to leave. So she stayed, but after this, Albert hadn't heard from Elaine in another three years. So Albert decided that he just could not stay in North Yorkshire anymore. He couldn't risk bumping into her or having others around him catching on to what he was doing. So this is when he made the move down to Devon, which was around four hours south. Here, he bought a sailboat, which he named the Lady Jane, but they didn't live there for long. They decided to move again to a house around four hours northeast of there in Chelmsford near Essex. This is where they rented that house under Ronald's name. And again, as we discussed earlier, they lived as a married couple in Essex and no one around them suspected a thing. Again, there was a clear age gap, but other than that, Albert seemed like he was a good and normal husband and father. He 
seemed to treat his wife very well and he helped out around the house and he changed diapers for the baby and he was a pleasant man who went to church. However, their seemingly perfect life could not last for long. As much as the real Ronald loved living in Canada, he also realized that he just wasn't going to be able to make it work. He tried so, so very hard to live there and to make things work there, but eventually he just ran out of money and he needed to move back to England. So after two years of living in Canada by 1995, he moved back to England and he decided to get back into contact with the one person that he knew there, his old friend, David Davis. Ronald had asked David for help with resettling into his new life in England. Ronald settled in a new town called Reading in England, about an hour and 20 minutes away from where Albert lived in Chelmsford. For the time being, things were just fine with the real Ronald moving back to England and Albert using his identity. However, Ronald started to have troubles at work, so he quit the job that he had just gotten when he moved to England and he moved once again. This was when he moved to Chelmsford near Albert, which obviously was going to cause issues for Albert. Again, for the months that followed, Albert appeared to be very welcoming towards the real Ronald. He appeared helpful and kind towards him, and he seemed to be helping him a lot with settling into his new life. By Christmas of 1995, Albert invited Ronald over to their home to celebrate Christmas with them. Now, at this time, it was clear to both Albert and Noel that Ronald just was not in the best mindset. He was really upset that he wasn't able to make it work living in Canada, and he he really didn't have anybody else to lean on at this point. So it seemed like Ronald was even more willing to spend more time with Albert since he seemed to be the only other person that he knew in the area. Also, as I stated before, it was after Ronald had moved back to Canada that Albert and his daughter switched from being dad-daughter to husband and wife. It's not really known what they did to explain to Ronald why there was a child in their home, and at the time, Noel was pregnant again, so we don't really know what what he did to explain this to him. But my assumption is, is that obviously they had to continue saying that they're father daughter. There's no way that they can suddenly just switch that and explain it to Ronald. So I'm sure they just explained that Noel got pregnant from someone who was unknown to them. The whole reason for them not wanting people to know that Albert was her father was because of how it would outwardly look to the community. They didn't think that people would accept, you know, this unmarried woman living in their community being pregnant with a child that no one knows the father of. So that's why they switched to husband and wife but I'm sure they didn't really care what Ronald thought of them at that point. So they probably just said like, she's a teen mom or I guess in her early 20s now and she got pregnant. Either way, Noelle went on to have her baby because as we know, by the time police caught up with them, she had a two-year-old and an infant. Now, as time passed with Ronald just sticking around the area, Albert realized that it just was not going to work with him continuing to use his name and with Ronald being around all the time. So, we would later find out what is thought to have happened to Ronald and why his body was found where it was found. So, it turns out that on the day of July 20th, 1996, Albert had invited Ronald onto his boat, the Lady Jane, for a fishing trip, and Ronald agreed. The two boarded his boat and drove around four miles away from the coast. Once they were out there and alone, Albert grabbed an anchor that he had previously bought and he hit Ronald in the head with it. Then once Ronald was unconscious, he was thrown into the water with the anchor tied around his belt loop to weigh his body down. So now let's get into all of the investigative work that led to them finding this out and all of the evidence that they were able to gather that led the police to this conclusion. Now, when Noel and Albert were finally arrested, they were separated and the two of them were questioned separately. Investigators wanted to know why she had these two gold bars as we learned about earlier, as well as all of that cash in her diaper bag. They also asked, obviously, about these forms of identification that she had, as well as the glaringly obvious age gap that her and her supposed husband had. It didn't take much before they just kept pressing her and asking her questions that she just could not answer, so she finally gave in. She admitted that herself and this man were not husband and wife, but father and daughter. However, when she was asked about who the father of her child is, she would not give them an answer. She also would not say why she had Elaine Boy's identification cards because again, she was still known as Noelle. 
Also, at that time, she did not admit to her father using fake identification either. Then, of course, investigators asked her about her father's whereabouts around the time that Ronald was known to have died. She said that in July, near the end of July, there was a week where her and her father were on vacation near the Devon coast. The two had boated together several times, and they were together the entire time. However, she recalled that there was one day in particular that week, which turned out to be July 20th, 1996. She said that on that particular day, Albert had gone out on the boat for a ride by himself. He left early in the morning and didn't return until later that night. This entire time, she didn't know if she was with anybody or what he was doing on the boat. So next, police went ahead and searched the home that they had been living in for those past two years, and they found a lot. In the home, they found 17 more gold bars. They found five oil paintings, three of which were purchased for $30,000. They found 25,600 British pounds, as well as 8,170 Swedish francs. They found numerous prepaid debit cards, as well as multiple keys to different lockboxes. They also found paperwork that showed that he had opened more than 40 bank accounts in 24 different banks located in Switzerland, Italy, and England, as well as the Cayman Islands. Then, in addition to this, they also found a receipt in the home from a fishing store located along the southern Devon coastline near where Ronald's body was found. There were several items purchased, including an anchor which were all paid for with Ronald's debit card. They were also able to identify Albert's 24-foot sailboat, the Lady Jane, in the harbor as well. When they looked into the anchor that Albert had purchased, they realized that this anchor just was not suitable for the boat that he owned. So they went to the store and spoke with the store clerk who sold that anchor, and this interaction had stood out to the store clerk because first, he described this man as being a very tall, friendly American man. Also, the store clerk thought it was weird that the man had only bought an anchor and not a chain. That's literally how you connect the anchor to the boat, so it was just very strange that he wouldn't buy the chain that you would normally get with it. Lastly, this anchor was about half the size of what he would have needed to secure the boat that he had, so all of this just really stood out to that cashier. Using this information, police went back to the fishermen who originally found Ronald's body and asked them if they had found an anchor and they had. They stated that they originally didn't notice the anchor, but now that they ask, they actually do know where it is. So, the fisherman handed over the anchor to the police, and the police sent it off to the forensic lab. And what they were able to find from this anchor was actually pretty cool. So, they compared the size and the shape of the anchor to the wounds found on Albert's body, and it was a match. They also tested the zinc coating that was found on the anchor and compared it to the zinc coating that they found on Albert's belt, and it matched exactly. They also found that Ronald's blood, as well as several strands of hair, were also found on the anchor as well. So, using this, investigators now believed that this anchor was used to hit Ronald in the head, and then it was looped through his belt to to weigh his body down once it was thrown into the water. This confirmed to them exactly what they needed to know about how he died, but now they needed to determine exactly when and where he died. So, they hired an expert to examine the waves and currents in the English Channel to determine just how far his body could have floated after being dumped. They determined that the currents just were not strong enough to pull his body very far at all, so where his body was dumped is the same place that it was found. Then, in a crazy coincidence, they found that Albert's boat was docked right near where Ronald's body was found. So, using this, they were able to seize the Lady Jane and examine it. They actually found a plastic bag with the store name that matched the receipt found in Albert's home. They also found all of the other items that were purchased that day as seen on the receipt on that boat. The only thing that was missing from the boat was the anchor. They also found hair, blood, and fingerprints on a cushion on the boat, and upon examination, all three belonged to Ronald. So then, going off of this, they know that Ronald was on the boat. They know that his body was found near where the boat is docked, but now they had to determine exactly when he was on the boat. So they found out using the boat's GPS that the last time that the boat had moved was on July 20th, 1996, and the boat's GPS showed that the boat only traveled about four miles. Then, in addition to this, police went back and used Ronald's Rolex watch once again. So 
this watch was a wind up watch and it only ran for 38 hours before it needed to be wound up again. They found that the watch had stopped on July 22nd at 11.30 a.m. This means that around 38 hours before this, this was the last time that Ronald was alive to wind up his watch. So this would match up with the timeline of Ronald last being seen on July 20th. Then we have this statement from Noelle, or I guess I'll go back to calling her Sheena, that on July 20th, Albert went on a boat ride by himself and was gone all day. So once the police finally had enough information to arrest and charge Albert with Ronald's murder, he was brought into the station and he was fingerprinted. Again, at this point, police still thought that this man's name was David Davis and that he was using Ronald's identity and that's about as far as they thought it went. But once the fingerprints came back, they learned that he is one of the most wanted men in all of Canada. They found out about the charges of him embezzling thousands, if not millions of dollars that he stole from his investors and then fled prosecution for six years. Then they learned of Noel's real identity, Sheena Walker. So at this point, finally, Barbara, who had been in Canada this whole time, having no idea where her daughter was, she finally got some answers. British police called Barbara to let her know that Sheena had been found and she was in England. Immediately, Barbara hopped on a flight and she was so, so very excited to be reunited with her missing daughter and to meet her grandkids that she previously knew nothing about. Now, as you can expect, after all of this came out, people were very shocked. Everybody who had known Albert in Canada and England were under the impression that he was this nice church-going man. Then all the people in England that he lived by, they were convinced that him and his daughter were actually husband and wife, but this entire thing was just a ruse. In Canada, he was wanted by several police agencies as well as Interpol for defrauding over 30 clients out of upwards of $3.2 million. Then in England, he was being investigated for being involved in a murder. So he was in trouble with a lot of people. By April 27th of 1998, Albert's trial for murder started and he pled not guilty. The defense said that Ronald actually took his own life after being depressed that he could not make life work in Canada. But of course, the prosecution came back and explained to the jury that back in Canada, Albert had started all of these different businesses, he got used to living this expensive, luxurious lifestyle to the point that he could no longer legally afford what he wanted. So he started stealing from his investors in amounts in the millions, but he was about to be caught back in Canada. So he took his teenage daughter, fled to England where he stole two people's identities and manipulated Sheena into going along with all of it. Then when they met Ronald and Elaine, they took their identities because they had convinced them to hand over their IDs. But when they both moved back, that made things very difficult for Albert. So he decided that there could only be one Ronald Platt in England. So he took him to the boat and killed him. Now, I do wanna just pause for a minute and say that I know a lot of people are shaking their heads at Ronald and Elaine. I know a lot of articles called Ronald a naive chump who just handed over his stuff willy-nilly. But I just want you to remember that this was carried out over several years. So imagine that you meet someone and they become a close friend, your best friend. Think of any of the friends that you are close with in your life. Then you're excited because they have this business and they now want you to work with them. So again, over months and months and months, things are going great and you continue to bond and you're getting paid and you're getting all the benefits that you were promised and nothing seems to be out of the ordinary. Then over time, they're starting to ask things of you that don't make the most sense, but you're new to the business world and this is your very close friend that you're talking about and they've never done anything to wrong you, so you have no reason not to believe them. Obviously, Ronald should have known better, but just put yourself in his shoes and think of your best friend and what you may have done in that situation. But now going back to the trial. So the prosecution brought forward a lot of the evidence that we discussed earlier, how his injuries on his legs matched where the anchor would have been tied to his belt and where it would have bumped into him as he was going into the water. How his hair, blood, and fingerprints were all found on the Lady Jane, showing that he had in fact 
been on the boat. Then the boat's GPS showing that the boat had in fact been taken out on the day of July 20th. Then 22 year old Gina went back to England to testify about her time with her father in England. By this time, Sheena had enough time away from the situation to actually realize what she had gone through over the past six years. He manipulated her into staying silent and going along with all of these stories and these lies. She felt in those years that she had no choice but to go along with it. She feared for her safety. There were some witnesses who, when they saw them together, they said that, you know, Sheena would say something and then she would look to Albert to see if he approved of what she was saying. To outsiders, it really just looked like she was passive and submissive to Albert, but at the time, they didn't think anything of it. They just thought again, this was a wife who looked to her husband for approval and nothing more beyond that. But Sheena went on to call him an evil, controlling man. He used hypnosis and other manipulation tactics to exert full control over her and to coerce her in following along with everything that he told her to do. She also testified that while Albert was awaiting trial in jail, he actually called her and begged her not to testify. He said that him and Ronald were good friends and he had no reason to kill him. As we heard from before, she also told told the jury about how he had gone out on this solo boat ride on July 20th. She did maintain that she had no idea that Ronald had gone on the boat with him, but she also said that she didn't think that Ronald was the type of person who would have wanted to take his own life because again, as we discussed earlier, they said that he wasn't in a great mindset when he got back to England, but he was not depressed enough to take his own life. The only thing that they didn't have was eyewitnesses that placed Albert or Ronald at the scene on that specific day. But like I discussed earlier, there were witnesses who saw Ronald in Devon just a week before his death and not in Paris like Albert tried to claim earlier. Then again, we know from earlier that both Albert and Ronald's cell phone data placed them in that location on that day. Then of course, as we know, Albert had been using Ronald's credit cards to pay his bill and then used his name to rent the house that he was living in. However, Albert actually took the stand to testify on his own behalf. He admitted that he is a criminal who stole from people and defrauded so many people out of their money, but he said that he would never murder anybody, especially Ronald, who was a very good friend to him. He explained that on July 20th, 1996, him and his family were all out on vacation. He said that Ronald happened to be in the area at that time as well, and he had just found out when they were already there. So he invited Ronald to come out on his boat. But when Ronald got on the boat, he was not feeling well. So he got off the boat and they didn't end up going anywhere together. Albert said that as far as he knew, after this, Ronald said that he was going to go to France, like we said earlier. So that explains why he was on the boat, why he was in the area, and then explains where he went after that. But it doesn't explain why his body was found in the water, exactly where they went on the boat to. So that was his story. Now, I'm sure a lot of you are wondering at this point why it's so hushed as to who the father of Sheena's children is. Even after she was reunited with her mother, Barbara said that the father is unknown and it's none of anybody's business anyways, which is true. But there was always this looming question about whether or not Albert is the father of Sheena's children. Obviously, this is incest and the court was considering charging him with this. However, they ultimately decided not to because they didn't want to unwittingly re-victimize Sheena or her two children. But there are rumors, you know, we go back earlier where Sheena had written a letter to the court saying that her father is more affectionate towards her and that she enjoyed spending more time with him. There were witnesses in the family who came forward who said that they may have been caught, you know, in bed together and things like that, but I don't know if it's true. I don't know if it's just rumored. So I'm just going to leave it at that. We don't know who the father of her children are but it's none of our business. If it is Albert, she clearly doesn't want anybody to know. If it's not Albert, she clearly doesn't want anybody to know either. So it's none of our business. So I'll just leave it at that. So by the end of this trial, after hearing all of the evidence in the case, the jury of eight women and four men went into their deliberations. They only deliberated for two hours before coming back with their verdict. 
they found Albert Walker guilty in the murder of Ronald Platt. The judge said that this was a carefully planned, thought out murder. He said that he is clearly a threat to the public and he sentenced him to a minimum of 25 years behind bars to be served in England. However, only six years later, by 2005, Albert was actually transferred to a prison in Canada to carry out the rest of his sentence. Of course, Albert's family was devastated. They were happy with the fact that he was overseas in England, far, far away from them. And especially Sheena, she was scared that him being back in Canada posed a threat to herself and her family. But the positive aspect of him being in Canada meant that the Canadian government could move forward on the charges of a fraud for the millions of dollars that he stole from so many people. Multiple people from his church, especially like I said earlier, elderly people, came forward to talk about just how much money Albert had defrauded them for. Obviously, a lot of people were affected by this. Multiple people went into bankruptcy and people lost thousands of dollars worth of their hard-earned money. So after hearing the stories of so many of Albert's victims, he was taken into court and he was tried for these charges. He was found guilty of 20 charges of theft and fraud. For this, he was sentenced to serve four years behind bars, which was to be served at the same time of his 25-year sentence. Just as a side note, I never understand why they serve two sentences concurrently. It almost seems pointless. If you get four years for one crime and 25 for another, why is it still 25? That doesn't make any sense to me. If anybody knows more about the legal system, please explain it to me because I don't understand. I think it's kind of pointless. I think it should be if you are in jail for a minimum of 25 years and that you get charged with something else, that should be added on top of it because that's two sentences, not 25 years. That doesn't really make sense to me. So again, if someone knows more about it, I would be happy to learn more in the comments. By 2021, Albert had actually applied for parole. At this time, he continued to deny that he was responsible for Ronald's murder. But at his hearing, he actually changed his story. He said that he actually did have a plan to kill Ronald, but he didn't go through with it. He said that he invited Ronald onto his boat and offered him a large amount of money and was going to tell him about everything that he did. He said that after this, he was going to get Ronald to agree to cut off contact with him completely in exchange for the money. However, Ronald actually found out about the plan that Albert had to kill him, and this made Ronald very, very angry, and Ronald was actually the one to hit Albert. Albert said that he went unconscious for a moment, and in that time, I guess somehow Ronald had fallen off of the boat and into the water. It was at that time that Ronald actually drowned. So, once Albert realized that Ronald had drowned, he decided to place that anchor in his belt loop and weigh down his body. That's the story that he was now going with. So, when he was asked why his story changed, he literally said it was because during his original trial, he had just forgotten. During his hearing, he also tried to downplay the effects that his fraud had on his victims. He said like they didn't lose too much money and they didn't go bankrupt, which isn't even true. He said that his reasoning for committing these crimes was because he was insecure and he didn't feel accepted by those around him in his community. However, because of how much he downplayed his fraud charges and because he continued to lie about committing the murder, his parole was denied. The judge stated, quote, the board finds you have a very superficial understanding of your risk factors. You have no insight into your patterns of deceptive behavior, your need for control, and the role your ego and self-image contributed to your offense cycle. As of today, Albert is still in prison in British Columbia in Canada. As you can expect, multiple books, documentaries, and even a play were made in relation to Albert and his crimes, but you guys know that I don't love dramatizations of things like this, especially crimes, so that is why I wanted to make a video about it so I could tell you everything that happened without all of the dramatics and, you know, replays and acting it out and things like that. So that is all I have for this case. I know that we talked a lot about how Ronald was a victim because obviously he is. He is the victim here, but so is Sheena. 
she didn't choose to stay with her dad that whole time. He kidnapped her. He manipulated her into going along with everything that he wanted. So it's definitely tragic that she had to go through that as well. It does make me wonder if the court considered kidnapping charges as well as incest, but I don't know. They probably just didn't want to re-victimize her, but they could have probably charged him with that as well, but I don't know. That's just my thoughts. He's in jail for murder, so that's what matters at the end of the day. But either way, finding out about how this investigation as a whole was conducted and all of the other schemes and lies that Albert had pulled, it was very interesting. I think he could have gotten away with his fraud and embezzlement charges for so much longer if he wasn't just stupid and decided to kill Ronald. He could have just moved again. He could have moved to another country or even a different part of England. Who knows if we even would know who Albert Walker is today if he didn't make the mistake of taking Ronald's life. I am very happy with the police in this case. I love how much work they put into solving this and for uncovering all of the things that Albert did to victimize so many people. I'm glad that they found this unidentified body and they did everything that they could to identify him and bring him and his family justice. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. I would love to hear your guys' thoughts in the comments below about this crazy case and how it all played out. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you click the link down below and head over to Liquid IV's website and use code RACHELSHANNON25 for 25% off of your order from Liquid IV. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe and stay healthy. And I really hope to see you next time. Bye.